As the title states, this video is going to focus on two very important trigonometric limits. Why are we going to look at these two basic limits? Well, first of all, because they are there, and so we may want to know something about them. Also because they will be the foundation for being able to compute other limits. But let's face it, the real reason for looking at these two limits is that we're looking ahead at two very important things we'll have to do later, namely computing the derivatives of sine x and cosine x. We're going to see that in order to compute those two derivatives, we need to find the values of the two limits I'm going to discuss. And it is the real reason why we're interested in them. So let's have a look at the first of these two limits. So the first limit we're going to look at is the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. You may remember that we have had a look at this limit already from the graphical and the numerical point of view. And we have had this kind of a notion that this limit looks like it's going to be equal to 1. But we haven't really come up with a good solid proof of this fact. Well, unfortunately, I will not give you a good solid proof here either. But I will give you two convincing arguments uh, that this limit is in fact true. The reason for that is that if you really want to get a full formal proof that requires so many technical details, that you'll probably get bored before uh, too long. So we're not going to go there. The first argument I'm going to give you is a visual argument. No, not based on the graph of sine x over x, but based on the definition on the unit circle of the sine x function. So let me remind you what that is. So we draw the unit circle and because we're letting x go to zero, we're only going to focus on the first quadrant. Uh, well, of course, we may want to consider when x is negative, uh, which would take us to the fourth quadrant, but the argument is exactly the same. So just for simplicity, let's stick to the first quadrant. Now remember how do we arrive at the sine x on the unit circle? What we do is we define or we choose an angle x and we draw a radius which of course is going to have a length of one and we notice that by the definition of the measurement of an angle in radians the length of the arc which is actually defined by this angle is also x radians and this is going to be very important because everything we're going to do and we're going to say in terms of calculus for trig functions is going to be in radians so by definition the length of that arc is x radians and the point of intersection between the radius and that arc is going to have coordinates by definition given by cosine x and sine x. Now I'm saying by definition, although of course you can prove that this definition is consistent with the right triangle definition of sines and cosines. In particular, the vertical distance from that point down to the x-axis is going to belong sine x, right? It's a y-coordinate, so it's the vertical distance from the x-axis. All right, so what are we trying to do here? We're trying to look at the ratio between sine x and x, which is the ratio between the length of this vertical segment and the length of the arc of the circle. So let's have a look at what happens to the ratio between those two lengths as x approaches zero. All right. So in order to make x approaches zero, we'll have to make it smaller. All right, let's pick a smaller angle. Now we're here. Now you'll notice that um, sine x and x are still in the same relative position and sine x is still smaller than x, but notice that they're getting a little bit closer in uh, relative uh, size, right? If we uh, zoom a little bit more in and maybe even if we take an even smaller angle, we can see that even more clearly. In fact, you I hope I'm convincing you that as x becomes smaller and smaller, the ratio between sine x and x becomes closer and closer to 1. Put another way, if x is approximately 0, means very, very small, then sine x and x are pretty much the same length. Yes, they're not exactly the same length, but they're pretty much the same. And therefore, their ratio is going to be approximately 1. And this approximation is going to become better and better as the angle becomes smaller and smaller. Notice that the circle becomes more and more vertical as x becomes smaller and smaller. You will notice, for instance, that this last segment on the screen here looks very vertical. It doesn't even look like a circle. It just looks like a straight vertical line, right? So uh, this leads us to conclude that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is, in fact, equal to 1. Now, notice this is not a full proof 
not a foolproof, but a full proof, uh, in the sense that um, I've been saying a number of things without really proving them and basically relying on your accepting what I was saying on visual grounds. So that's why we call this a visual argument, not quite a proof. Now, are there more formal proofs? Yes, and there is one which is actually a standard proof which you'll find in many books, and I'm going to very quickly go over that one. But as you'll see, that one is still not really a proof. So I'm going to give you a more formal argument for that limit. And this is again the traditional argument that is given. It starts in the same way, so we're still looking at the same picture. And we're noticing that sine x uh, is the vertical segment joining the point to the x-axis. x is the length of the arc. And we're going to need one more piece, namely the geometric interpretation of tan x. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it turns out that the tan x is going to be given by the length along the tangent line to the circle at the point 1, 0, which is cut off by the radius of the angle x. And that's why that thing is called the tangent of x. So now you can look at the picture and uh, realize that sine x, the length of that vertical uh, segment, is less than x and that x is less than tan x, right? Well, that's where the formal argument becomes a little bit less formal. Are you really convinced, have I really given you a proof of the fact that x is less than tan x for every angle x? Now, that actually needs a little bit more of a proof, so that's one aspect where we need to go a little bit more in detail in order to be convinced that this is, this is in fact true. That's why I don't see this one as a formal proof either. Again, it's a very strong argument, but of course this is not the end of the proof because we don't even have a sine x over x yet. So how do we get there? Well, first of all, we take that uh, set of, inequal of two inequalities and we divide everything by sine x. Um, on the left hand side sine x over sine x becomes 1 on the right side tan x over sine x becomes simply 1 over cosine x so we end up with this set of inequalities if we flip the fractions upside down and therefore of course we flip also the inequality in the other direction that means that 1 is greater than sine x over x and this in turn is greater than cosine x now, if we let x go to 0, which is what we're trying to do, of course, cosine x goes to 1. And so what happens is that as x becomes 0, sine x over x gets squeezed between 1 and 1. Well, <laughs> where else does it have to go? Uh, by a technical uh, tool called the squeeze theorem, which you will find in your textbook, uh, we can conclude, in fact, that this is true and that that limit is indeed equal to 1. But notice once again, this is a little bit of a more formal argument, uh, uses a different kind of idea, but it is still um, based on you trusting me that some of the things I said are, in fact, true. All right, let's have a look at the other important trig limit. The second limit is the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine x minus 1 over x. Now, this is not so much important for its value. I can tell you right away that that limit is equal to 0. Okay? And so it's easy to remember. But it's more important because of the technique that we use in order to find it. In fact, what we're going to do in order to find this limit is we're going to be rationalizing. And you might think, well, how can we rationalize since we don't have square roots? Remember, the method of rationalizing for a limit uh, is useful when we have square roots. We don't have one here. But if you look back at how that method works, it works by using the difference of squares formula. Well, the difference of squares formula turns out to be useful in this situation as well. Let's see how we're going to do it. So we're going to take our limit and we're going to multiply and divide by the conjugate of the top, meaning cosine x plus 1. Now, we use the difference of squares formula on the numerator, and that tells us that that limit is going to be equal to cosine squared x minus 1 all over, well, we're not doing anything on the bottom. Now, remember the basic Pythagorean identity? Uh, that tells us that sine squared is equal to 1 minus cosine squared, which means that cosine squared minus 1 is going to be equal to negative sine squared of x. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split that numerator into one sine x and another sine x, since I have a sine x squared. So that will leave me with the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x, and then what am I left with? I'm left on the top with another negative sine x, and on the bottom with a 1 plus cosine x. But now we know what the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is. We know that's equal to 1. And the second fraction is not really a problem because the top goes to 0 as x approaches 0 and the bottom approaches 2. So this is not an indeterminate form. In fact, it's a very clearly defined form and it is equal 
to, as I said, zero. Okay. So we can conclude that our limit is zero. And as I said, the important thing about this limit, or actually the two important things about this limit is number one, the method to compute it, rationalizing, and number two, the fact that this limit will show up when we try to compute the derivatives of sine and cosine.